family and we are very glad that you are here this morning with us. So you heard the Christmas story dozens of times but this morning I want you to kind of slow down and muse on the shepherds who first heard the announcement. I did take some effort uh, to read up the various aspects of the shepherd story and the angel's message to them. Okay, we have heard this story for those of us who went to Sunday school. Uh, we heard it right from those uh, younger days. But this morning, please give your attention to the shepherds a little more than you had before. So the scripture says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. I don't know how much. Okay. Right. Uh, and uh, there are shepherds keeping watch over their flocks. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. So tending flocks with agriculture formed the basis of the Palestinian economy. And, uh, and sheep raised on the hillside around Bethlehem, where Christ was uh, seen, uh, may well have been meant for temple sacrifices in Jerusalem which was only like six miles to the north. Is this disturbing you? Am I to switch? Switch on. It's okay? Okay, no. Uh, so commentaries describe a shepherd's life as moving about during the rainless months, staying away for months in isolated areas far from the owner's home. So that was how the shepherd's their lifestyle was so herding sheep was like an independent and responsible job because of the threat of wild bees and robbers. It could even be dangerous. Did you get, are you following the life of a shepherd? Uh, sometimes the owner himself was the shepherd the, and or sometimes his sons did the job but usually by hired hands. Some of Israel's great heroes were shepherds. Can you think of some of them? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and so on and so forth. So they were great heroes. And you find both in Psalm 23 and Jesus in John chapter 10 compare God's care to that of a good shepherd. But in the first century, at the time uh, before the first century, shall I say, a couple of years just before, uh, it seemed that shepherds, specifically the hiring shepherds, didn't have a good reputation. Uh, it is thought that most of the time uh, they were dishonest and thieving. They let their herds into other people's lands, preferred the produce of the land. So that was the reputation of the the shepherds and they were often accused of stealing some of the increase of the flock. So they were sheep stealing. Okay? So shepherds were not allowed to fulfill like a judicial office or they wouldn't even be admitted in court as a witness. So they didn't have the normal rights that a, 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 a ordinary citizen had in Jerusalem or in Israel. Uh, it is commented, commentary say that there was nothing more disreputable occupation than that of a shepherd. Looking after sheep and goats was treated as like a mean and inglorious thing. It was really right down at the bottom of society. But the thing is, quite in contrast to religious and social contempt for shepherds, Jesus distinguishes between the good shepherd and the hiring in John chapter 10. If you will, note it down, chapter 10 verses 11 to 13. He relates the parable of the shepherd leaving 99 sheep in the fold while searching the hills to find the missing one. Uh, perhaps this, this is because Jesus always associated with the despised, the sinners, but appreciated them as people. So this morning I want you to think a little bit. Do you feel like a missing one? He went after the missing lamb, the missing sheep. Do you feel like a missing one? One who has strayed from the fold. If that is so, if you are feeling like that this morning, 
uh, I bring you good news. And along with the along with the uh, along with the shepherds, uh, along with the angels that brought the good news, let's read Luke chapter two, verses eight to fourteen. I mean, as is our habit, shall we read it together? Can you see now? Can't see right in the back? You have a Bible? Right? You have the Bible? Yes? Can you turn to chapter, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14? It is our habit and my recommendation that we always carry the Bible when we come to the house of the Lord. Is that good? Please discipline yourself and let's be uh, good disciples, good followers, good worshippers in the Bible to the house of the Lord. Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Yes. So it is uh, it is very significant that uh, it is to this despised, I gave you the background the despised class of people that the angel appeared with this message. Even as the shepherds were terrified, you know, nothing like this has happened. We are not even allowed to go to a courthouse or the normal uh, rights of the citizen are denied, but suddenly. So they had a very low opinion of themselves. Uh, you know, their own identity was wrapped up in their occupation, so they didn't think too much about themselves. And then suddenly this startling phenomenon takes place. And then they, they are terrified and the angel moves first to calm their fears. Did you notice that? And the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. See how broad the message is, it's not just for the pious or just for the religious in the Jewish community, it's for all the people. And the birth is unto everyone, for everyone's benefit. And it's also the immediate message, today, not tomorrow, not in the years to come, but today. This day is born to you. So it's excellent news, wonderful news for those who are estranged from God, struggling under oppression and, uh, and actually have no, and don't even have a good uh, view of themselves. You know, their identity is all very low and mean. They are, uh, they, their identity is tied up in the way other society, religious community has treated them. And to them comes this message. And the baby is not just born to Mary and Joseph. The baby is born to you. The baby is born to you. To the shepherds, to the shepherd recipients of the message. It's to all our people. It's to all our relatives. It's to all of our family. It's to all of our work colleagues. It's to everybody. It's even to our neighbors, everyone. Even to those whom we cannot get along with. It's for everybody. We will not rejoice in that. Because it's a message for everybody. This morning I want you to think of your unsaved loved ones. Those whom you have been praying for, for years. You've been praying for them. I want you to remember that this message is for all people. 
prayed for my father as a young child for eight long years till he came to the Lord. I want to encourage you, those of you who are praying for your loved ones, that the message is for all people. And it is a message that's offering freedom from fear. Don't be afraid. You know, all of us have fear of something, isn't it? We are not, all of us are not scared of the same things, but we all have fear of something or the other. There are different fears. Sometimes we fear people. Sometimes we fear, uh, fear our fear of to sit for exams. Sometimes we fear to go to work. Sometimes we fear we will fail. Sometimes some fears are easy to cure, to get over. You know, if you are afraid to fly, you can get over it. You don't fly. You stay home. Okay? And if some people are afraid of snakes, what happens? It's quite easy to avoid, avoid getting, coming, encountering a snake, isn't it? How are cockroaches? Oh, they are everywhere. So these are all have fears, isn't it? So I know I can see the way all of you are prompting each other, right? Fear of cockroaches. Actually, I'm the one who is. I can preach, I don't fear demons, I don't fear devils, right? I don't fear those who oppose the gospel, but you could send a cockroach my way and you find me screaming and running. And you know what is so good? I'll share something out of my life and this fear, that's a shame. I'm a pastor and I'm afraid of that little fellow who runs around. And you see, God is so good that wherever I am, we live with cockroaches are everywhere, but wherever I am, they come and they fall down, upside down, and they are there. Understood. There's a young, there's a man, not young man, Chandran is downstairs. He comes to clean our home once in a day, and then he comes with the whole house, especially in our guest room. Oh, Lord, I'm cockroach. And he says, We are Koma Barilla. Who the Barilla? God is good to me. You want that anointing? Right? You invite me to your home. So, but there are other fears we have to face then, isn't it? There are fears we have to face, like being afraid of the future. Isn't it that? Though we are afraid of the future, right? Especially when we grow older in years, we kind of wonder what will happen to us. We are been living, right? So when we have this, we are, when we are afraid of the future, then that doesn't mean that the future stops happening. Does that mean? Can our fear hold back the future from going on, taking place? Can we? No, we can't. So, you know, it's an unreasonable fear. So, we have also fear of losing those we now. And that also we can't hold on to them. Just because we fear, oh God, what will happen? Mom will not be there, dad will not be there, husband will not be there, child will not be there. You know, that doesn't mean we can hold on to them. So, because eventually, even as the future goes on, the cycle of life, everybody dies, no matter how well much it practices. So, the question is, as Christians, how do we handle these kinds of fear? When the angel said, don't be afraid, he's also saying that through that baby in the manger, God offers you and I the gift of freedom from fear. That's the message behind the angel. He's offering us freedom from the fear that grips our hearts, that makes us, you know, panic attacks come, and then our heart goes doom, 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 and we can't stop that happening. Isn't it? We feel pain, all these things. And the angel's message is the baby born in Bethlehem is our, God is offering you the gift of freedom, emancipation from fear this morning. And incidentally, I want to maybe uh, give you some information. Yes, uh, what uh, what might be the most popular or best, most referred to scripture in 2019 according to you version. I got some information. You versions, 400 million users. You version all over across the world, 400 million users. And the most referred to scripture is what? Philippians 4 and verse 6. Shall we read it together? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. What's
also the same behind them. Why are people, 400 million, out of the 400 million users, why are most amount of people referring to Philippians 4, 6? Because everyone is looking for a way out of fear and anxiety. And what fear does Christ offer us freedom this morning? I'll just discuss two before, because of time constraints. Firstly, fear of the future. So there's another word for the fear, for fear of the future, and that's called what? You have heard this word? I'm worried. See, I'm worried. Right? And worry is being afraid of what might happen or of what we are convinced will happen. You see, you, we can give messages, we can sing, the worship leader will practice, the team is here, the intercessor is praying his face, blue is face is becoming blue, all that is happening. But if you have decided this is going to happen, you see no one can drive away the news from you. So you must come alongside the world this morning. Is that okay? And decide the things that you are convinced will take place, we, is going to stop this morning. That's my hope. I prayed, I prayed for this message with all the people of God that we will be emancipated. So though nobody but God knows what might happen, isn't it? Why are people running to soothsayers? Why are people running to horoscope readers? Why? Why are they running offering their lovely hands to different people and getting them to read things? Why? What will happen to, to me? What will happen? You know, though we think like that, though we can speculate, we can expect the worst, you see, only God knows our future. But the question for us is, how will I handle what will happen? We need to come to terms with these things, walk with our feet on the ground. Will my really think if it's too much to handle? What if I fail? What if I fall? What if I lose what I have? Lose those whom I love? How can I face the future with shame, with embarrassment? Will condemnation be my lot? See, these are things that we as human beings do. Not pastors are not teaching. If you will let me be really honest with you, one day, some of you have heard this story, one day my husband and I, uh, we were coming uh, for the Bible study here in the old, older building, the old house was there, this is some time ago, and uh, as we were approaching the cemetery, suddenly I thought to myself, my goodness, if my husband here passes away, you know, I have no income, how am I going to live? How, what is going to be my future? No one is going to bother to give me an offering, right? And you know what's going to happen? I have suddenly fear struck me. Maybe those were my thoughts, the truth. Those were my thoughts which I was voicing out suddenly to me. Well, he looked at me very, uh, very tenderly and with uh, thought about it for a little while and uh, with a calm assurance he told me, don't worry, you will die first. <laughs> so, there we are. <laughs> That's a man of faith. <laughs> so, the uh, family of God, I want to tell you that the babe in Bethlehem's manger grew up to be the one who assured us of freedom from fear, from freedom from fear of the future. We sing, isn't it? Because he lives. Shall we all lift up our voice to the Lord? Everybody come. Let me join in this.
verses 25, 32, and 234. Okay, shall we read that together? Let's hear the voice of God. As we hear the word, faith comes into our hearts and fear departs. Therefore, I say to you, everybody, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Jesus is saying, don't worry about tomorrow. The same God who watches over the rest of his creation, he, he keeps a close eye on you. Jesus was born to remind us of God's love for us. A love that frees us from fear by giving us confidence that God can take care of all our tomorrows. How many of you came into this house or came to the Lord with so much of fear, fear of lack, fear of poverty, fear of loss. How many of you came like that? And this morning, you know, you, you, your world has been turned around. You know you have been made a prince and a princess with God. Your world, world has been turned around by Him who was born in Pandya, who grew up to, to free us from the fears that torment us. Fear has its torment surely, but He is there to deliver us, to redeem us from the torments of fear. Another fear He offers us freedom from is, consider, think about this, because these are things, shh, don't speak. Fear of death. Who should we don't speak? But we must face up with these things, okay? Because then, for many, it's the ultimate unknown fear. Fear rises in our minds when we lose a loved one to death. Fear raises its ugly head when we think about taking our last breath, closing our eyes the last time on earth. Friends, I am one who has walked in the valley of the shadow of death. I know how death came to me uh, so many years ago when I was just 24 years old. My mathematical calculations are not very great. I'm 66 years old now. So you can decide how many years ago, right? So 20, I was just 24 when I was in the peak of hell, right? with ambition before us, thinking I will see to it that my husband is the best qualified, best physician this side of the Swiss Canal. My ambition was so vast, so broad, right? So I was like that. And then suddenly one day, unannounced, the sudden release, the shepherds had a sudden visitation from the angel, and I had a sudden visitation from a spirit of death. And it came, and it, I was knocked out, it came and was grappling for my life. I tell you at that time, you know, it's terrible. When you know that you are fighting for your breath, I, I couldn't finally lift my little finger as my breath and my pulse was leaving me. And thanks be to God, it's a long story, but as, as my life was ending away, I saw my husband, he was standing by, we had just married under a year, and I saw tears trickling down his eyes. And he was feeling so hopeless. Doctor, though he be, he can't give me life. He can't make my pulse to work again. He can't make my heart to beat. And I saw him, eyes tearing. Strong young man he was. And then, as I was looking at him, in the face, suddenly the voice of the Lord came across the room. And the first time I heard the voice of God like that, and the voice of the Lord said, You are afraid to die. You are not ready to meet your king. And in that great moment, I sent out prayer, God, save my life, spare my life, and I will serve you. And the Lord spared me. And you know, my prayer, my promise to you, Lord, spare my life, and I will serve you. And that is the one of the reasons that propelled me in the 
the call came to give up a lucrative profession, I must my husband. When the call came from God above, I knew life is like a spider hanging on that silver thread. You see a spider go up and down, it can be cut off so easily. Friends, whole life is what, what we have deposited in the eternals that will be with us for all time. Remember these things. From people who have experienced what it is to face death. Now I know when people are in the toes of death, what they feel. And I can pray with humility. I can pray with, with compassion, knowing the struggle for death and for life. So, and the angel went on, went further to say from Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And Christmas is expected to be a season of joy. But joy is not always easy to come by, even at Christmas. Why is it so hard to be happy? See, happiness passes away, but the spirit of joy remains within us. Why do good times never last? Why is it, why is it that people say, why is it that every bright day is followed by dark clouds? The reason is because the world is infected with a deadly virus called sin. Sin masks every beautiful thing in this world. It puts black marks on our record. It stains, our, it stains us with guilt in our conscience. But the angel announces that this baby will bring great joy because this baby will be the answer we are looking for. The cure for the things, the, the answer, the fancy is the right word, the answer for, for our struggles. Because he's the savior who will bring back genuine joy because he will save us from our sins. And yet, Despite sin, here is this angel promising peace on earth, peace between God and man. The baby born in Bethlehem, the angel said, offers us peace that never ends. Do you want peace that never ends? Because we sigh and we stare wistfully and think, when will that be? You know, I work with children, I work with the orphan children, so I know what it is. Because we can sell, we can give them clothes, we can give them food, we can give them nice things or whatever, we can send them to school. But still I see at times when they sit down and they stare wistfully. They look into an empty space outside. And I notice that those are the ones who go astray. They are the ones it's hard and they have no hope. Brothers and sisters, appreciate what you have. Because I know what it is, and I work with those kids, what it is not to have. Appreciate what you have, appreciate life, appreciate family. It's such a gift from God. Though we sometimes feel hopeless, the gift of peace is available to us right now. That peace is not necessarily a change in your circumstances circumstances, but a calm that can fill your mind and heart, that even during the worst storm, a, a, a contentment that poverty or plenty cannot take away, a sense that God is in control no matter what happens. So many of us believers, we go through these stormy times, we have high ups and then we find we are right down at the bottom. It's a sense. Peace is not something we work up or we earn, it's a gift from God. And this morning, I want to encourage you that you can unwrap today a gift that is bound up with the birth of Christ. So, God sent His Son to be born in Bethlehem to give you some very special gifts. First is freedom from fear, the joy of salvation, and peace that lasts for time and eternity. So you don't have to wait any longer to open those gifts. Open out your hands this morning. Because if you feel you don't have it all. Open out your hands and, re and receive these gifts. He will fill them when you come.
come to the Lord. The Bible says, Jesus says, He that comes to me, I will no wise cast out. You can unwrap these gifts that are there specially for you. Tailor made for you with your name written on it. Right? With your name written. Tailor made for you. This gift of self, freedom from fear, the joy of salvation, peace that lasts. I really don't want any one of you, a single one of you, to please leave this place this morning without fully understanding that God's love for you, God's love for me, means that He would become man. That's what we are celebrating during Christmas time. That God, that Jesus, that God would become man, that He would live, that He would die, that He would rise again, to make sure we understand that God exists and that God did it all for us. He only asks that we surrender our ways to know Him. It's simple, but not so easy for many people. So this morning, I trust you will open your heart out like the shepherds who believed this terrific message suddenly. They believed it and they left the sheep, or maybe I don't know whether they took the sheep or whether they left the sheep behind, but they went looking for the Savior. Are you willing to leave, let go, let me buy the things of the past and go and come this morning and look for the Savior? He will bring both salvation from enemies, from sin, it's not just for the Christians, but to all people. What are you afraid of this morning? Are you surprised and shocked? Never it be. Please, these gifts are for you. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, the Anointed One, the Empowered One. And on another note, for those of you who know the Lord a little more, it's interesting that Jesus chose to be born in a secular stable rather, rather than a religious shrine. Those of you who gone to Israel have seen where the place was, where the supposed place where Christ was born is all religious now. But when, when he was actually born, it was a secular stable. He chose for his first worshippers filled hands who were ritually unclean, unwelcome at the temple, socially downtrodden. Some of the first religious leaders who met him were really unbelievers, pagans from what we call Iran today, the three wise men. Jesus chose to make his home in Galilee of the Gentiles, the scripture says. Neither he nor any of his disciples had any reminding training. None would be ordained as we know today. Because God intends his kingdom to extend to every corner of culture, not just the parts we call Christian. So his message is for everybody. Make an effort to speak. This is a good time that you can speak through a testimony, through some answer prayer request, whatever way, to all those who are near and dear around you who are yet to receive the Lord Jesus Christ into their hearts like you have done. I came across this man called Abraham Kaufer. Here he is. He says this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. Everything in human existence is His. It's all His. And I want to, and, and will you fully surrender to the sovereignty of Jesus this morning? Will you all you say, this part is mine, and keep the skies for yourself? Then you'll be like me, you know, when I was 24 years old. I said, this part of my life is mine. And I found my mistake. Don't let that happen. You know, there was a, remember, there was a difficult, cumbersome journey to Bethlehem by a pregnant lady about, in turn, about to deliver. And we find in Micah chapter 5, the great prophet, Micah chapter 5, was a, uh, Verses 2, 4, and 5, we find him prophesying something like this. 750 years before the birth of Christ, and he prophesied. He said, you, Bethlehem and you are small among the clans of Judah, but one 
come from you to be the over his head for me. His origin is from the days of eternity. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majestic name of the Lord, his God, they will live securely. He will be their peace. See, that's scripture. It was known that the prince is coming out of this little town of Bethlehem. We see town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light. But it was the place, in this little place, the ruler was to come. And two verses later, in verse 4, we learn how the Messiah would fulfill his calling. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And as a result, he will be our peace. It's his strength that gives us the peace. The peace of God comes to those who depend upon the power of God. And here's this man called Henry Noah. <clears throat> he said something wonderful. He's a theologian and he speaks something like this. He said, it's hard to believe that God would reveal his divine presence to us in the self-emptying, humble way of the man from Nazareth. Are you hearing me? Let me repeat that. Henry Newman is saying, it is hard to believe that God would reveal his divine presence to us in the self-empty, humble way of the man from Nazareth. Because so much in us states influence. So much in us seeks influence, seeks power, success and popularity. It's very hard to believe that God would reveal in that self-empty way, in that humble place called Bethlehem. It's all become real ritual and now we have idolized it. The crib scene and all that. But it wasn't like that when it really happened. But because it's hard to believe because man, you and I seek influence, power, success and popularity. But the way of Jesus is the way of hiddenness, powerlessness and littleness. It's not a very appealing way to humankind. The littleness, the hiddenness. Are we this Christmas willing to hide ourselves in Christ of God? In our weakness, will we make him our strength? When we enter into true communion with Jesus, we really understand the babe born in Bethlehem we will find that it's a small way that leads to real peace and joy. You know, if you need this money for whatever, when you look back at 2019, you need to turn, turn back and humble yourself before somebody. Go do that. It's the little way of Jesus that gives us the strength we need. If you need to put things right, you are struggling with pride and arrogance and self-will and the power-filled way we spoke, the demands we made, you know our flesh was ruling. If we were like that, it's good time before we get to the next year. It's good time to put ourselves right. Remember the little town of Bethlehem. That cumbersome journey that teaches us the littleness the hiddenness of the Christ. And I want to leave this question with you. Would others recognize this strength of peace and joy of Jesus? The strength of peace and joy of Jesus during this Christmas time. With your relatives, when you go for dinners, when you go for meals, you go visiting people, when they see the strength and the joy of Jesus in your life, out of littleness, hiddenness, and I want to take you to a promise there in, in Micah chapter 5 and the fifth verse, the full, full verse. When the Assyrian, and, and the Bible says he will be our peace. When? Why do we need peace? Because the Assyrian, the strongholds, the principalities, when they come to eat up our flesh, you know the Bible says he is our peace. That he, when the Assyrian comes to 
to trample us down, he is our peace. Did you get that? And we say from Psalm 37, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of oh, what shall I be afraid? Though a ghost should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though an army encamps around me, to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fall. But one thing I have asked of the Lord, that the Lord will I seek after, that I may dwell in God's house, in His presence, to hear His voice, and to see the beauty of the Lord. Is that you, my friend? Could that be you? Could that be me? Could we walk this Christmas time with that testimony written over our hearts? When I came in here, Rashani told me, there's writing on your sari. You see, yes, they don't get notice that the writing is on my sari. I want to ask you, do you have the writings of God? Do you have the writings of God? Do you have the writings of God over your life? You let the writing, the handwriting of God be written over your life. You live this Christmas and go move into January 2020 with good vision, 2020 vision, having buried the past under the blood of Jesus. Put things right. Make yourself little humble, it's okay, because He will be our peace. The strength of the shepherd will be ours. And when your space is being trampled on, He will be your strength. He will be your peace. May God bless you as I hand over the mic to Roshan for the waterfall. Will you stand to your feet?